Hello, everyone. My name is Diane Olivo Posner, and I am the Principal Librarian Associate Director for the Exploration and Creativity Department of the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm Steve Orozco, Library Assistant for the Exploration and Creativity Department. And we're here to introduce today's LA May program, Saving Bees with Byron Levy. First, we wanna thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LA May programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you would like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org forward slash events, E-V-E-N-T-S. And for our LA Made programs specifically, you're gonna to wanna to visit lapl.org forward slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts, video links, and all other kinds of fun things that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. Uh, don't miss our next LA Made, which will be next Thursday, August 12th at 4 p.m. right here, YouTube, Facebook. Jane Russell, 100 year centennial. Our own librarian and Christina Rice, who's also obviously an author. She's a senior librarian of the Los Angeles Public Library's photo collection. Christina will be in discussion with James Sherman, a librarian in the literature and fiction department. Um, he will be discussing with Chris, uh, Christina's about her newly published biography on Jane Russell, which is titled Jane Russell, Mean, Moody, Magnificent. Jane Russell and the Mark Marketing of a Hollywood Le Marketing of a Hollywood Legend. It's by University Press of Kentucky. Yeah, uh, sounds like a great program. Uh, and now for what we've all been waiting for, I'm very excited to introduce today's LA Made program, Saving Bees with Byron Levy. Uh, Byron Levy began to uh, pursue his interest in bees in 2010 through a group hosted by the godfather of urban keeping, Kirk Anderson. Byron's interest blossomed to passion quickly after he rescued his first swarm. Since then, he's followed a path forged by bees and operates a bee removal business named Save My Bees, as well as its parent company, Byron's Bee Company. Uh, today, Byron will invite you to join him in his apiary will, uh, where you'll get to experience a close-up hive inspection. Dip your mind into one of the most complex and evolved insect colonies on our planet and learn the basics of what keeps beekeep uh, or what beekeepers are looking for during inspections. Welcome, Byron. Hello, thank you so much. Um, you know, thank you to the Los Angeles Public Library and, and thank you to you both for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, very excited. Um, we are here live in, my, in one of my apiaries. This is uh, the apiary I have at my house and uh, it's the first place bees come when I remove them from people's homes. Um, I, I bring them here, I uh, get them reestablished, make sure the queen is healthy, make sure the hive isn't too aggressive, and some of the hives stay here, and then some move on to other apiaries around Los Angeles and Ventura counties. Um, yeah, so what you have here are three of my larger hives. Um, we have, this is the bigger one, and maybe you can kind of see what's going on here. This is five boxes, and what I have here is a, a queen excluder, and a queen excluder prevents the queen from getting up to a certain point so that she's not laying her eggs up there and it's easier for me to pull the honey off and process the honey. Oh, cool. um, yeah, so that's the intro. Uh, thank you for having me, and, and it's a, it's, I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Thank you. Thank you for uh, doing this program with us. Um, where, uh, how hot is it out there right now? Is it, is it a comfortable... It is a comfortable 93 degrees, and I think after uh, <laughs> after our 110 degree days, anything below 100 is you know is easy breezy. And uh, we've got a nice breeze here. The bees are nice and calm, and uh, I have a little smoke going here mm -hmm. to assist me in keeping the bees calm. 
Um, smoke acts as a, it diffuses their alarm pheromone if, if the bees are concerned about anything. And um, it suggests to them that there might be a fire, so they might focus on gathering the resources inside the hive in case they have to take off. So they're less huh? focused on what's happening in front of the hive and more focused on preparing for a potential uh, quick exit. Wow, they sound very organized. Yeah. yeah, I always wondered when you'd see. Yeah, bees are, uh, you know, bees are amazing. It's the, the more you learn about bees, uh, it's sort of like uh, it's their their own rabbit hole. Uh, you learn a couple things, and you're like, wow, really? That they can do that, or they they know this, and then you find out more and more, and and then you just begin your love affair with kind of all insects in the environment. At least that's how it worked for me. Oh, very cool. Uh, uh, so they're they're doing okay in the heat. They're not uh, too disturbed by the yeah good question so um you know like us once we get to that 100, 120 degree day uh nothing really survives that very few trees um can handle that and and what bees have to do is they thermal regulate so, so maybe you can kind of see at the entrance of some of these hives there's always bees um at the entrance and on really hot days you'll have thousands of bees kind of come out of the entrance and uh, reduce the heat on the inside. So when we have the 120 degree days, um, it's very difficult for bees to regulate that. And oftentimes wax will melt uh, no matter what they do. But uh, some things that I can do as a beekeeper is um, allow some uh, air to escape from the top as well as the bottom. So there's it circulates a bit easier. Um, but yeah, 90 degree, even 105, 110, 110 is kind of pushing it, but they handle it quite well. Um, yeah, they're, they're experts at thermal regulation. Very cool. So organized and resilient. Yeah, and incredibly <laughs> intelligent. Yeah, and, you know, awesome. one of the interesting things I like to do at night uh, when it's nice and warm out and the hives are really big, sort of this time of year, even spring, um, is just kind of come out to the hives at night and just sit by one and, and listen to, to their buzz. Um, it's very calming, actually. Um, yeah. Hold on, a train's going by. <laughs> and we're back. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Do they? Do they get? Um, do they get um, uh, agitated? Disturbed or agitated by noises? Yeah. Yeah. yeah certainly. Um, any kind of vibrations that uh, affect the hive on the inside. You know, if okay. if I want to sort of test the aggression level of a hive that maybe I'm removing from someone's home, uh, the first thing I'll do is, is bang on the wall where they're located and see what happens. Uh, mm -hmm. A very aggressive hive, when you bang on the wall of, of their home, um, if they're really aggressive and really dangerous, almost the whole hive will come out and, and try to attack you. Um, wow. <laughs> a less aggressive hive, maybe a couple bees kind of come out to see what's going on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, with the, I think these, these, these bees here, these hives are pretty accustomed to the train going by, uh, a few times a day and that doesn't really bother them. At least I hope not. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wanted to say, I wanted to say, I noticed, um, in my father's backyard, there was a bunch of, by a tree. It sounds like there's in the morning, there's a bunch of bees inside the tree. Like it's, yeah, that sound. Yeah. Yeah. So I get, I get calls, uh, from, from people, uh, quite often thinking they have a hive inside of their tree when oftentimes it's a tree that's in bloom and a hive or multiple hives actually just know that that tree's in bloom and they're gathering all the resources. And when you think about the difference between the blooms on a tree and a bloom, the blooms on a plant, a tree might have hundreds of thousands of flowers on it. Whereas you know, a rosemary bush has several hundred or even a thousand or even you know, a rose has one flower. So, um, a big bloom on a big tree can uh, often be confused for a hive inside of a tree. And it's also an, uh, an amazing event to be sort of near that many bees. Um, yeah. And yeah. it's always in the morning. So I figured, I remember we had talked before and you said usually they're in the morning is when they're, you know. That's when they start their work. That's, uh, you know, the crack of dawn is, is when bees kind of uh, wake up and get moving. Um, and so, what you have in a hive is you have three types of bees. You have the bees that sting everyone, you have the queen bee, and you have the drones. And the drones are the males of the hive. They don't have stingers. Um, mm -hmm. They don't gather food. The only thing they do all day is look for a queen to mate with. And throughout 
the area where, so here I'm located in Northridge, um, the drones will fly to drone congregation areas every day. And they just kind of know where to go. And then um, unmated queens, perhaps a hive is swarmed or a queen, an existing queen is, is, is failing. And so um, a hive will start a new queen. Huh. Once that queen is born, she has to mate with the drones in order to become fertile to, to lay eggs that then become bees. So once that queen is born, she takes off on her mating flight and she might be gone for a couple days and she flies at least a mile away from where she came from. And she knows she also just knows where to go uh, to find them wow. to find the drones. And she'll mate with up to 70 males in the course of 24 to 48 hours before she comes back. And you think about this little tiny insect has to fly a mile away to um, at least a mile away to protect herself from inbreeding of of ge of local genetics that might be her own hive. Um, and and then she's got to breed and then she's got to make it back. And you think about like all of the obstacles. There's there's uh, birds, uh, people, uh, trains, you know, all these things that could just kill a queen quite easily. And more often than not, she makes it back unscathed. So wow. that right there is, is pretty amazing to me. That is really amazing. 700. <laughs> uh, 70, 70. Did I say 700? 70. 70. I'm sorry. Um, Even 70. Know, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and these these types of things I'm talking about now uh, are, are what happens in the wild. All the bees I keep are uh, wild bees. Um, mm -hmm. I don't introduce any uh, commercially bred queens. And one of the reasons I don't is because commercially bred queens, unless it's from a top-notch breeder, um, mm -hmm. have far less of a, a genetic diversity. Um, so oftentimes commercially bred queens are um, selectively bred with 10 males and thrown in a box and they're sort of like forced to mate. Um, so smaller genetic pool and, and intentionally chosen by humans. And um, from what I've learned about bees is they really know what they're doing and uh, I trust them unless they get mean. And when they get mean, that's when I have to get involved and, and take that queen out. Huh. Oh, man. Wow. And there was a couple of questions. Uh, this one came in. Did, did, it, did we ask this? Oh, it's from Elliot. Uh, did you see that one, Steve? Can you put it up? Oh, any yeah, recommendations? Sure. Any recommendations for new beekeepers? How do you get into this amazing craft? Thanks, Elliot. Thank you, Elliot. That's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> well, there are a couple of organizations that I follow locally that I believe in what they're doing. They've been around for a long time and uh, provide a wealth of, of knowledge and experience with beekeepers there and uh, with meetings and, and, and the events they organize to introduce bees to newbies, as it were. Um, the main group that I'm involved with is one of the oldest beekeeping groups in Los Angeles, and that is the Los Angeles County um, Beekeepers Association. There you go right there. Mm -hmm. um, and we put it in really, the chat too earlier really fantastic group um they have uh, a meeting once a month on mondays first monday of the month it's right now it's on zoom and anyone can join um i think in the near future they're talking about getting back to a live event as well as having zoom but it's a it's it's a fantastic resource and they often have uh guest speakers um talk about a variety of topics whether that's bee health um or for example, this this past Monday, um, Brett Adi was was the guest speaker, and this is a guy who has who manages eighty thousand hives and travels the, the country year round with pollinate pollinating uh, all kinds of crops. Um, and hearing someone like that who's been beekeeping for you know thirty or forty years and manages eighty thousand colonies, just being able to expose yourself to that is is fascinating and. In addition to that, uh, there's a wealth of, of talent and knowledge um, open to answering very newbie questions. Another group I recommend is called Honey Love. Um, Honey Love is a nonprofit, and it was founded by a couple that uh, I met while in during my sort of formative beekeeping years um, through the same uh, group that was hosted by Kirk Anderson. 
Honey Love uh, has a different approach. They're more of a treatment-free, organic method of beekeeping, um, which is sort of like I'm a cross between organic, treatment-free, and introducing some commercial techniques to improve honey production. Those are the two best groups I would recommend in Los Angeles, um, but there are a variety of other groups depending on where you're located. Um, yeah, so thanks for that question, Elliot. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, we have some other ones too. How, how, oh, which one do we want to go up? What makes them? Oh, what makes bees aggressive? From Patty. Thanks, Patty, for sending that in. Patty, good question. Uh, the queen. The queen dictates the entire mood of the hive. Um, certainly, bees can get angry if if I want to make them angry. But overall, um, their overall aggressiveness is dictated by the queen and the eggs that she has and, and who she was fertilized by. Um, mm. so it does happen sometimes that I have a hive that's too aggressive. And one of the reasons, one of the ways you find out if a hive is too aggressive is by opening the top. And if you open the top and a thousand bees jump at your face and, and try to attack you, that's really dangerous. Yeah. And you got to get rid of that queen. That's happened to me a couple of times. Uh, but that was many years ago. And right now I'm in a really good spot, uh, with gentle bees, as you can see, um, I'm, I've got three here, but there's uh, another eight or so beyond what you can see. Wow. And, uh, yeah, you know, I think what we'll do right now is, is, is I'll kind of show you. Um, well, you know, I, I, I made a little video. Do you have another question? Uh, well, we, can show, we can show the video first and then, and then uh, we can come back for questions if you want to do yeah. that. Okay, so what I, what, I, I, what I produced here is a little video that is sort of a taster uh, for what it means to be a beekeeper um, and a little bit of more information on, on bees and, and how they operate. And uh, without further ado, um, there you go. For most bees, their day begins at first light. The foragers leave the hive to gather supplies for the hive as well as themselves. The resources come back in the form of nectar, pollen, water, and tree resins. These supply the energy required to build honeycomb, expand the number of bees in a hive, and coat the inside of the hive with their external immune system, also known as propolis. As the hive grows, a beekeeper's job is to balance their space, restock their pantry, and be on the lookout for problems. During flower blooms, hives will need more space to store their food and expand their numbers. The times of year without blooms are known as dearths and hives with too much space and not enough food are in danger of developing larger problems. Over time, a beekeeper's observational skills improve exponentially. The more hives a keeper has, the quicker they have to determine the overall health of each hive. The inspection begins at the hive's entrance. Are there a lot of bees flying in and out? Is there any level of aggression towards the bees arriving at the entrance? Are there any visible ants or wasps? The initial external assessment can help focus the keeper to hives that may need more attention than others, and a more detailed inspection begins. Removing the top of the hive immediately reveals critical information. What do you see? What do you hear? How are they reacting to you? The most important bee in the hive is the queen, and we need to make sure she's healthy. Fortunately, we can do this without actually finding her, and the first place we look to determine her and the hive's health is the brood chamber. The brood chamber is the area in a hive where the queen lays her eggs, which then develop into bees and drones. A beekeeper wants to see a solid brood pattern. This indicates the queen's egg-laying capability is optimal, and it suggests the overall health of the hive is strong. In addition to brood patterns, we want to make sure they have the food stores required to expand their numbers or simply keep the hive strong going into winter. Once the foragers have returned, the nurse bees transfer the resources and store them in the honeycomb. Once transferred, the foragers return to flight to continue their gathering, while the nurse bees tend to the brood chamber as well as all of the other critical components of the hive. Their work continues to sunset, at which point the foragers return home and the hive rests until the sun rises on a new day. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so 
something that always pops out to me when I watch that is uh, when I talk about the nurse bees and, and sort of the, the differences between uh, the foragers and the nurse bees. So mm -hmm. what you have when, when the queen lays an egg, that egg develops into a larva and right before it, the larva gets, when the larva gets to a certain age, it's capped. Um, you saw in that video, that was a, a frame of brood with, with capped brood. On the outside of, the, of that video was honey, or I'm sorry, on the outside of that frame was honey. But in the center, that's capped brood. When the bee is ready to emerge, um, she chews her way out, she chews that capping off and then emerges. And the, her first role in the hive is a nurse bee. Um, she does not like light. Um, she's very sensitive. She's not aggressive. Um, and over the next couple weeks, what happens is every day in the afternoon, around two o'clock in the afternoon, the nurse bees leave the hive and they do this little tornado outside the hive. And what they're doing is they're gaining their flight wings and they're gaining the confidence to leave the hive and come back. So you have the nurse bees, they're born a couple weeks later, they become about three weeks later, they become foragers and the cycle just continues on. But all bees are bees and just depending on their age they have different roles within the hive there's also sort of the defenders of the entrance there's just bees right at the entrance and and maybe you saw when i when i pulled up the lid and i, I showed the propolis maybe you saw a cu couple bees kind of pop up and look what was going on um th those are the bees that are really kind of checking out making sure everything is good around the hive making sure they don't have to defend against bees or humans or any other invader um, and yeah, so it's, there's three bees, but they take on different, the, the bees have different roles depending on their age. Um, how, and how big this are those? concept again, it, uh, extends to swarms. So, uh, ever, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of swarms and, and probably even seen them in their lifetime mm -hmm. when they see, you know, thousands of bees flying in the air, or maybe a ball of uh, bees on a tree and that's a swarm. Um, a swarm happens for a couple of reasons, but the most common reason that a swarm exists is uh, a hive has is doing really well, and typically they've mm -hmm. run out of space in uh, the home that they're living in. And so they say, okay, you know what, they're, we've run out of space, it's time to split up. And you'll have uh, that queen, the original queen, with about two-thirds of a hive take off. And before they take off, they start a new queen. Um, and and once that new queen started then they leave they fly somewhere and they land now once they land somewhere you have those experienced foragers uh they then search out new homes and this is this is part of the rabbit hole of once you learn about something about bees it just blows your mind and if you are at all interested i highly encourage everyone to pick up a book uh check out some of these groups or even watch, you know, this 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 stream right here, and learn a little bit more, and maybe that 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 interest will become a passion for you. Anyway, um, the swarm, the experienced bees go and look for a new home, and they are looking for very specific characteristics of a home. And and um, through the work of Dr. Tom Seeley at Cornell University, he's proven um, that bees can measure. Um, the inside of a cavity and they are typically looking for a 40 liter cavity that is uh, higher off the ground and always southern facing they won't always be able to find a southern facing home but typically that's what they'll they'll look for so these experienced bees will go and look for this home and, and if one bee finds this new home that they'd like they come back to that swarm ball and they start advertising where this new home is and they're <laughs> able to communicate to these other bees exactly where to go exactly how far to fly and these other bees will find this little hole in a wall that might be you know several hundred yards away or even half a mile away um and some of these other bees will go and check out this potential new site and if they like it they measure it they fly up and down inside it they measure the walls by literally crawling along the walls and then flying all around and if they agree that it's safe, it has the, the space required, then they come back and they start advertising where this new home is. But if some of these bees don't like this particular home that this other bee found, they'll stop the bee that found it from advertising that location. So if that <laughs> bee's, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. So if this bee is advertising this location, and what, it, what they do is they do this little uh, butt shake, 
real quick. It's like, it's like, you know, just milliseconds of a butt shake. And within that butt shake, um, it tells the other bees the distance to fly and the direction to fly for this new home or source of food. GPS. So, <laughs> yeah, GPS, right? Or GBS, right? Um, um, uh, so if some of those bees don't agree on this new home, they'll, they'll stop the bee that found it from advertising that new home by butting them. So if this bee's advertising it, they'll, they'll, they'll track down this bee and like headbutt them. And they're like, no, 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 that's not the spot. We don't like it. We're not going there. So now this is another part of the fascination of bees. So it takes a majority of the bees to agree on a new home before they actually take off. They will, they will not leave and find a new home until a majority of these experienced foragers have agreed that like, okay, this is the spot. And once the majority of the bees agree, what happens is all these foragers, they start warming up this big ball of bees. They'll, they like crawl through it and they warm up all the young bees, all the nurse bees. They're, they're like, they do this vibration thing to get everyone ready. And once they're ready, they take off and it's bit this big cloud of bees. But what you don't see in this big cloud of bees are these foragers. And these foragers, what they're doing is they lead the charge. So you, you'll have um, this ball of bees flying through the sky and within that, you'll have you'll have these experienced bees darting through the center. Or let me drop back. Darting through the center and then falling back to the back of this the ball of bees and then darting through. And what this does is it tells all of the young bees exactly where to go because the young bees, like I said earlier, the nurse bees, they don't really have the the, the confidence to fly, um, and and they need some direction. And so these foragers are the direction and and the guide to this new home. Jeez. And once they land somewhere and once they move into a new home, typically it's like a, it's like a, a quarter of an inch hole in a wall, a stucco wall of, of your house. And once they land, they'll move into this, this hole within like five minutes. And most people don't know that a hive is there until months later, because uh, when they move into a wall or some enclosure, they have all the resources they need to start building the hive. And that's the first thing they do. And within uh, a week or two, there's fully formed uh, honeycomb and the, the queen's laying in it already. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally Crazy. amazing. And then, and then it's like, you get into the concept of like honeycomb, like what is honeycomb? How does it just appear? Right. It's like, what do they do to make that? Well, on their abdomen, um, they emit a little tiny s scale of beeswax. It's like, like a fish scale. It's tiny. <laughs> And if you saw that video that, uh, that I produced, you'll see a moment where I'm talking about um, the energy required to build honeycomb. And you'll see like a bunch of bees hanging from each other. That's called festooning. And, and the bees will festoon from a, a frame. And then another bee will crawl on the other bees and grab a little piece of wax and bring it up. And they'll like form it in their mouth and they'll attach it little scale by scale by scale by scale until you get... Let me pull uh, a frame out for you until you get a frame of, of honey and I'll pull one out for you right now. Wow. Yeah, man. Dang. They're hard working. I'm like tired from all. The <laughs> <laughs> We're going yeah. from dawn till what do you say? Two o'clock until, yeah. until sunset. Every day they're out here doing it. They're not just nine to five. No, no, no. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, and I, that, that was a really cool video where they showed the close-up of, of him pulling that off, too. I really like that. All that um, prepolis. I'll have to ask him what it's called again. Yeah. So there goes the smoke. Yeah. Calming him down. Here, let me make it. You can kind of hear him. Let me do this. There you go. Oh, wow. Here it comes. Put my glasses on. <laughs> yeah. Full screen, everybody. Full screen it. Ooh. Wow. Oh, wow. So this is a frame of honey. And Super cool. You can kind of see some of the holes, like at the top here. Uh -huh. Right there. Um, but this entire frame here was built scale by scale and until it was totally filled out. Wow. Do they know. have do they have like a starting location? Do they start like in one corner? Do they Well, yeah, they they'll typically up? start in the center and then kind of like build uh, sort of a 
a, a, a cone shape, you know, like with a point at the bottom and then it just expands out. Cool. That's teamwork. That is teamwork. Yeah. We gotta be more like bees. I know. They're so smart. Let's see. That's amazing. Let's, let's ask Byron. Tara Smith has a question. Can you eat yeah. honey straight from the honeycomb? I think you can. I've seen that. I've eaten it, actually. Yeah, I've seen it, too. And he's chilling them out again. He's closing it up. Yeah. So they can get back to work. <laughs> back to work, everybody. 431. That's not quitting time yet. Nope. <laughs> so we so have a question. Go. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Can you eat honey straight from the honeycomb? Oh, absolutely. Um, and it's it's really like there's you've never had honey taste better in your life than that moment when you just take it right off the comb and uh, you know stick your finger in there and put it in your mouth. It's it's the best honey you've ever had. Um, and honey is I'm sorry, and wax is is just fat. So you can eat wax, but the older the wax is, the harder it is. So it doesn't it doesn't chew so well. Very new wax is is more edible, but uh, it, it's got to be very new. What you saw there is is a frame of honey that's been in there for a couple of months. Um, and maybe you saw it looked a little red. Um, honey ages like like wine. And the longer honey is in the hive, the the, the denser, the denser the honey, uh, the more complex the flavor. Um, and it's just it's a, a far superior honey than than the honey that is pulled out as soon as it's ready. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah. This is a question I had earlier uh, from Maria. Thanks, Maria. Are apiaries safe if there are curious pets, dogs, and cats around? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, it's certainly up to the beekeeper to make sure that the hives are, are calm and not too aggressive. Um, I have a tortoise here. I've had dogs here in the past, and it's uh, like, you know, like myself, uh, a dog, a curious dog will get stung occasionally. Um, you may not have just a minute ago when I was putting the lid back on, I got stung on the face, but you know, I'm, I'm, oh, no. I'm it doesn't bother me at all. So uh, yeah, dogs can get stung. Humans can get stung. Uh, my tortoise got stung right in the eyeball once and uh, I had to, oh. I had to take the stinger out. So stings can happen, but it's not like anything's going to get full out attacked by thousands of bees. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's see, we have a couple more questions here. Yeah, um, some really good questions coming in. Yeah, let's say Nancy is asking if uh, my fourth grade student wants to know how you uh, breed, I guess, uh, bees. But you kind of went over a little bit. Yeah, yeah well, so um, you can do it artificially um, and, or you can just let them do it naturally. Naturally, uh, you, you can stimulate a hive to produce queens. You know, you can put special cups inside of a hive and create what is called a queen bank and, and graft the eggs from... The, the honeycomb and put it into like a little queen cell and then allow a hive to to start a queen which then needs to be uh fertilized and for a beekeeper that's going to do queen breeding um they mm -hmm. have special boxes where they combine drones and a queen um so it's it's kind of a controlled mating environment or if you live out in the middle of nowhere there are queen breeders who uh sort of have control over the genetic pool within their region and they'll live out in the middle of nowhere where they are at least mostly sure there aren't any other wild hives or other beekeepers and um, they'll have all their drones out there and they'll, they can just let uh, queens breed naturally mm -hmm. um, so those those are the kind of, kind of two ways um, yeah um, Terry Markson sent in a great question pollinators in a garden are a good thing so when would you want to have them removed so I, I'm assuming she means like a wild hive gets started. Yes. Well, that's usually how uh, most people call me. Um, I do bee removals uh, through my company, Save My Bees. And um, typically people will call me because they have a hive in a tree or in the side of their house and they have a beautiful garden. And when they've, they knew the hive was there, but they decided, you know, they love bees, they love the garden and they just wanted to let the bees be. Well, what happens is if they have enough space, um, what starts off, you know, rather tame and, and um, not too aggressive can kind of change when you go from 
5,000 bees to maybe 100,000 bees. And when you have 100,000 bees, you just have that many more um, protectors, defensive bees that are guarding the entrance, that are guarding the perimeter. And you might have a day where maybe it's too hot. Um, maybe the hive is being invaded by ants or wasps. Um, mm -hmm. And then that can really agitate a hive. And when a hive is agitated, they emit a defensive pheromone that permeates throughout the whole hive. So all of the bees are on edge. And when all of the bees are on edge, they're, they're uh, very sensitive to movement, like people walking by or dogs walking by. And so I will get calls saying, you know, I have this hive. I love bees. I wanted to leave it, but I'm getting stung. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's got to go. And I get that kind of call a lot, actually. Um, but for me, it, it's okay because mm -hmm. I'm able to take a hive that might have been aggressive in that moment or even that week or so, and I bring them to my apiary, and I'm, I'm able to assess their aggression. It, when you remove a hive, it, it really disorientates them. So if they were really aggressive um, in that moment, maybe they're not going to be aggressive a week later. But if they are, then I, I have to replace that queen because uh, aggressive bees are dangerous. Right, right. We talked about that, that if you get stung, some people aren't allergic. I had a cousin who was, and we were little kids, and his hand yeah. blew up like a balloon. Yeah. Um, yeah, some people don't know till they're stung. So. Right. And, well, you know, and this is a really good point because um, most people will talk about uh, being allergic to bees because they got stung and their, their hand swelled up. Well, um, everyone is – if you think about it like that, everyone's allergic to bees. So I just got stung in my face, and it hurts. But I get stung so much now that I just don't swell up. But uh, when I first got into beekeeping, if I got stung on my face like I just did a few minutes ago or I get stung on my hand, my face would swell up, my hand would swell up. Um, and But that's, that's like a common allergic reaction. Uh, somewhere like around 1% of the population of the world, maybe a little bit more, actually goes into anaphylactic shock and is in danger of dying from a, a bee sting. But very, very, very few people actually have that. And there is uh, a therapy, there is bee venom therapy that can um, help uh, cure um, severe allergic reactions to bee stings. Oh, cool. So they yeah. just uh, they just kind of like, do they get like a, a, a bee and just kind of sting the person with it? Or they get a little um, piece of the... Uh... I've, this is something I've just been, I mean, I think, I think it's more like actual, like a more of like an injection or actually taking some bee venom. I don't, I think it's, I don't think it's as, you know, like getting, taking a bee and stinging you, although you can do that. Some people just do that themselves to, to build their immunity. But uh, I think bee venom therapy is more clinical and, and, and can more of in a controlled environment in a hospital type setting. Yeah. There's a question from Tina here. She's asking if uh, uh, pets can have allergies to bee stings like humans. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and certainly their reactions can be more severe. Um, typically, it's mostly swelling. I don't know of any. I've never heard of any kind of dogs uh, going into anaphylactic shock from a bee sting. But I have seen some pretty bad swelling on uh, on maybe a dog's face from getting stung on the lip or something like that. Um, but some... I, I don't think be I don't think dogs quite have the same don't have the same sort of a histamine reaction to bee stings as we do though. Okay. Oh, someone just asked, someone asked earlier when we were talking about how great honey was. Um, is there a place that you recommend to buy great honey? Oh well, um, me. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's that's for another episode. I also have a, a full on <laughs> commercial honey processing facility. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun processing honey and also quite messy if you don't have the right equipment. Um, as far as like where to go, I mean, the farmer's markets are a fantastic source because uh, most of the farmer's markets have local beekeepers. Um, you know, what you're going to find at Whole Foods or any supermarket is going to be produced more like by these guys that have 80,000 hives or even imported from Argentina. And you don't really know what you're going to get, um, especially if it's imported. It, it could be cut with uh, corn syrup or, or just adulterated honey in general. So I really do recommend not buying um, imported honey if you can avoid it, unless you are certain that the person you're purchasing from is, you know, providing you with a, a first class product. Right. On the topic of honey, there's a question here from the audience. Uh, Evelina, 
uh, is asking, if you remove a hive, are you leery of the honey that comes from certain places or do you just discard it? All the honey I remove generally goes back to the bees. Um, sometimes I come across a hive that is so remote and it's so big and the honey is, is so special that I'll keep it. Um, but 98% of the time, all the honey that I get from hive removals goes right back to the bees to help them uh, reestablish the hive in their new location and give them the resources they need to sort of like uh, have those honey stores that they need to mm -hmm. build their numbers and stay strong. Yeah. So they don't have to have like, you know, a specific honey from a specific hive or anything like that. No, I mean, um, bees are pretty resourceful. They, it's, it's mostly about sugar. Um, obviously honey has a lot more nutrients in it than, than, than syrup. Um, honey has got pollen in it and vitamins and minerals and stuff like that. So it's certainly better for them. Um, but it doesn't matter if, if they're getting what honey they're getting, but, uh, they also do quite well with, uh, sugar syrup if you have to give it to them. Yeah. Hmm. And that's something I will do, you know, I have hives out in remote locations that don't have the abundance of floral resources that we have in an urban environment. Um, you go out to areas like Fillmore, which is near or past Magic Mountain, and so that's a farming community. Um, and you'd think, you know, keeping bees in a farming community must be pretty easy. It's actually the hardest place to keep bees because uh, when you have bees in these agricultural zones, you have a couple of serious issues working against you. One, there's like one or two massive blooms per year because you have thousands of acres of a single crop, whether that's uh, citrus or avocado or whatever they're growing. And there's just this one big bloom typically in spring, but you know, sometimes it's staggered uh, for a couple months going into summer. And then there's nothing for the rest of the year because all the water in that area is, is, is sucked from the ground and just given to the crops to grow. And then the other thing you have going against bees in, in these agricultural zones are the pesticides. Um, even in, even in, I keep bees on an organic farm called King and King Ranch, which is 30 acres, but bees fly at least a mile or up to, I mean, technically they can fly six or seven miles to gather resources, but if they have resources nearby, they typically won't fly further than a mile away from their hive. So when you keep bees it, on an organic farm that's only 30 acres, they're still going to the neighbor's farms to gather nectar from citrus trees. And more often than not, those, those farmers are spraying insecticides. And that's also one of the big problems we're having um, with bees when we talk about uh, bee problems, bee, bees disappearing. A lot of that has to do with the chemicals that are used to treat crops. Is, and now is that a specific bee or is it or is it um, like all bees that are kind of going through that kind of um, bee, like mysterious bee death? Well, I mean, that's sort of like a, that's a larger environment, environmental issue. I mean, um, it's probably affecting, you know, I mean, it's definitely affecting our immune systems. Um, it certainly has an effect on all all pollinators. It's why we're seeing the collapse of uh, monarch bu butterflies um, and all these kinds of things. And uh, yeah, you start getting into like the agricultural zone and it gets a little depressing. So that's why I like to keep bees out in like away from these types of places and more um, wild habitats where mm -hmm. it's just, you know, wildflower or, you know, areas, pastures where you have naturally growing hundreds of acres of sage, you know. Um, but as a beekeeper that is, is trying to catch that honey flow, it's about knowing when these blooms happen and being able to get hives to an area to catch that bloom and and move them out when when that bloom is gone or feed them if you're going to keep them there and so go, going back to uh, what i was saying earlier about feeding i do sometimes have to provide uh, sir syrup to bees uh in in the times of year where there's nothing in bloom and and they're too far away from anything else so do you yeah. oh go ahead, brings, i was just going to say i know you talked about that you have different you don't just have the bees that are behind you you have some other locations do you yeah. have to rent the area or do you it's your land that you have the bees on or no no it's it's, it's typically people that uh are enthusiastic uh to have bees on their property or it's a win-win situation where it's a farm you know um mm -hmm. um but uh no people are pretty excited about uh, the prospect of getting some honey um in exchange for having bees on their property you know as long as they're not getting stung of course 
yeah, someone's taking care of it for them. And, yeah, okay. yeah. So here we have a question here from Maria. She's asking, uh, if we see a bee struggling on the ground, what can we do to save it? I've heard of giving them sugar water in a teaspoon. Is this accurate? Can this even be done? Um, yeah, that can be done. Um, and I admire the the love of bees to want to do that. Um, I think that uh, Maria should uh, check out some of these links I sent and, and maybe uh, attend a meeting or two. Uh, that sounds like someone who's going to go down the rabbit hole of, of bee love. <laughs> is that kind of something that you do with the bees, uh, like when you give them the, the, the syrup or the sugar? No, typically, so, so, so bees, uh, as I've been talking, bees are really intelligent. And um, they know when there's something wrong with themselves. And when you have um, a big bloom in spring, when everything's in bloom, bees will typically work themselves to death within two weeks. That's why a queen is, is, is laying so many eggs uh, throughout that time, just nonstop throughout the day. She's laying eggs and then, you know, uh, a 3,000 strong hive can go from 3,000 to 15,000 in, you know, a month or two. It, it happens quickly when the bloom is there, but bees don't live long during that bloom because they're working so hard. Um, and th that bee uh, may also have some disease um, or they're too old, but they sacrifice themselves. They'll leave the hive if they know that they're at the end, near the end of their time. They'll just fly away or they'll crawl away. So typically when you see a bee like that on the ground, uh, it's probably the end of their life. And if you want to provide them sugar, uh, I admire that and um, I think you should do it. This brings me, I have two questions. Um, they might be in the chat too. What's a the general lifespan of a bee, which I know everyone could find out this question if you check out a book from the library, or, yes. and I should say, um, um, when you see there's, if you're around pools, it seems to attract bees. Is that because they're trying to get water to take back to the hive or? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, what was the first part of that question? Uh, lifespan yeah. of a bee. Lifespan of a bee, lifespan of a bee. So it depends on the time of the year. Um, it, when you start with the queen, the queen can live up to six or seven years, which uh, when I think about like a little insect, maybe an inch long living six or seven years, that always blows my mind. Yeah. Um, and then then the drones, the drones live as long, the drones are the males, and, and they live as long as the bees let them live because the times of year that there is no uh, flower blooms and there's no food coming in, if resources are low in the hive, the bees kick all the men out. They're not allowed in because all the men do is drain resources inside a hive. That's it. Like Hi they guys. can't, they can't feed themselves. The other bees have to feed the men. Um, and yeah, so a lot of times you'll see at a, t at a specific time of year, you'll see a lot of dead bees in the front of a hive and it's almost always drones because there's nothing in bloom. And the girls are like, out of here. You're Wait. gone. They need Maria to come over with some sugar water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, but then the bees, the regular bees, it, like I said, depends on the time of year. So mm -hmm. spring, it's a couple weeks. When the blooms uh, slow down, they can live five or six months. Uh, like if a bee that's born in September can certainly make it to the next spring. But as soon as that, that spring starts up and the blooms really... Uh, bloom, then, then she'll only live t about two weeks after that. Wow! It's like you know, I think we've heard of the like, maybe you've seen some Western movies or something like that where the horse just works itself to death. Yeah, mm -hmm. they just keep going until they die. Well, bees do the same thing. Wow. Earlier, there was a question about how many different kinds of bees. I think it was from um, Tara. But this brings me to we're we're doing a LA Bio Blitz, and one of the indicator species was or is the um, bumblebee. So how are bumblebees different than honeybees? Do they have hives? Do they create? Yeah, um, bumblebees are very, bumblebees are, oh, man, they're so beautiful. They're like these hairy little, like miniature <laughs> dog insects. I just love them. <laughs> um, and uh, they're, they're so powerful. They're one of the few pollinators that can work through like heavy rainstorms. They just keep going because they're so strong. They can power through massive winds and huge rainstorms. 
Um, and one of the differences with bumblebees and why we don't see them here in an urban environment is because they build their nests underground. It's a much smaller nest, maybe a couple hundred uh, bumblebees in total. Um, and in an urban environment, we sort of like own all of the the land, right? It's it's pa it's paved. It's your backyard, and and typically um, people are quite afraid of insects, and they're spraying lots of stuff, or it's just it's packed, compacted down just from walking on it, or cars, or whatever the case may be. So once you get outside of this in urban environment in Los Angeles, you get up to the Angels Forest or even Calabasas, um, you will find bumblebees. And uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're super special. Um, I wish there were more here in, in the urban environment. Do they go for like the bottom of, of trees? Because I think I, we had one in, in our backyard. I, I, I'm <laughs> sure they can. I, you know, that would be, you know, like sometimes you have a little cavity, a root mm -hmm. cavity. Um, yeah. Bees will also, a hive can move into that kind of environment as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's bumblebee habitat. Um, and as far as the, how many variety of bees there are, there are a ton of native bees. And most of those bees are solitary creatures. Um, and they're much, much smaller. Uh, and they typically live in like the very small cracks or uh, little holes in, in, in wood. There's carpenter bees, which some are often confused for bumblebees because they're big and black, um, but definitely not a bumblebee. Bumblebees have stripes and, and hair, lots of hair. And that's always another, it, it makes me think about wasps because I just did a wasp removal the other day. And people often confuse yellow jackets for bees. And one of the quick, quick ways you can distinguish between a bee and a wasp is bees have hair and wasps don't. So there's that. But as far as like the variety of bees, um, that's, you know, that's a good library book question because there's a lot of, uh, of native bees and there are some things you can do to, um, to, to help native bees. You can build little habitats. And there is a, no a nonprofit who uh, was on LA Made uh, about a week ago called Behind the Beat. Uh, Vanya Vanessa Vanessa Kuhn, and uh, she is going to be doing a uh, a very special native bee project. Uh, I think in October. You'll have to check her calendar, but uh, tune into that to learn more about uh, native bees and and maybe get a part of her program. Yes, super cool. Um, her baby will about, be born by then. <laughs> <laughs> speaking about wa uh, of of wasps and bees, there's a, a question from Terry. I have a. a uh, marjoram, marjoram plant that is swarming yeah. with uh, what appears to be different types and sizes of bees and wasps. Are bees and wasps adversaries? Yes. Um, when they're foraging, probably not so much, but in, in their homes, wasps are carnivorous. Uh, and well, not all wasps, but certainly yellow jackets are carnivorous. And I guess a lot of hornets too. Um, and they will invade beehives and eat the brood because that's all the, the protein that's what they're after um, so i think in a foraging environment you don't have anything to worry about but uh yeah good for you to be able be able to grow uh, marjoram that's it's not easy to grow those herbs yay terry <laughs> wow yeah i don't like wasps i got stung by a wasp once they're not nice well you know uh, some wasps are 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 better than others the they're the paper wasps, which you see, they build a little paper nest, sort of like hanging from the eaves of your roof or oh, up, up higher. Mm -hmm. And they never get much bigger than like, you know, a softball, but they'll never attack you. Like, unless you go swatting at, at that, that hive, they won't attack you. And they're so beneficial. Um, all wasps do eat mosquitoes. And so, and they'll eat mosquito mm -hmm. larvae. Um, so they really do help keep the mosquito population in check, which I know uh, recently here in Los Angeles has been a very big problem. Uh, huge problem. Yeah. Huge problem, like bigger than it's ever been. So wasps are good in, in keeping uh, mosquitoes in check. And they also eat, you know, um, aphids and all kinds of other garden pests. So they're, they're good. They really are good for the garden. And okay. okay. Uh, Except for the one that bit me. Except for yeah, that well, one. You know, <laughs> you may have gotten too close to the the nest, no. but like the, the wasps that have that that really long body with and they look they look menacing. They've got the long legs and they're like really long with it like Scary. short short butt yeah. but like really 
thin body between their head and their butt. Mm -hmm. Those are paper wasps. Sometimes they're mud daubers and so beneficial and really not aggressive. Um, so I encourage you to like try to live with those ones. Okay. The if they eat mosquitoes, jacket. I'm all for it. I'm, yeah. Yeah. And just to let everybody know, we have a neighborhood science program and one of the uh, highlighted uh, programs is about mosquitoes and for people to be aware of and learn about the mosquitoes in our area. Um, uh, I wanted to mention a really good book um, that I know everyone can check out of the library. It's, uh, it's a great, great place to start, and it has a lot of valuable information. It's called The Idiot's Guide to Beekeeping. Um, the purple, I guess there's sort of like two versions, or maybe there's three. There's the orange, the purple, and the yellow that mm -hmm. are sort of like the dummy, the, the idiot. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the purple one. It might be orange, but it's The Idiot's Guide to Beekeeping. A lot of just valuable, easy-to-read information about bees. And 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 the basics, and uh, that's where I that's where I started. That was the first book I read, uh, I guess, eleven years ago now. And uh, yeah, check out check out some of the books at the library for sure. Perfect. So check that out on our on uh, our catalog. I'm sure we have it. And if not, you would, could, you could request, oh. and we'll try to get it. You definitely have it. <laughs> yeah, Byron checked it out from us. So hey, I there did. We <laughs> <laughs> All right, are we running out of time? Are we still some time? Yeah, we have we have about four minutes. Is there any? Oh, um, somebody asked a question. Uh, I know. See, I want more time. Uh, we're going to have to have you back, Byron, because there's so much. Um, I have these. This has to do with color. We were talking about color earlier. Um, right. I have these low-growing flowers, pink, purple, yellow-looking in the grass. They are so low you can hardly see the bees resting on them. So we had talked about color. Are bees attracted mm -hmm. to certain colors, and which ones agitate yeah. them? Yeah, so um, from what I understand, and you know, um, my approach to beekeeping is certainly less scientific, and and I have to rely on what the scientists have discovered to for this information. So what I know is that bees uh, are colorblind to the color red, but they can see just about every other spectrum: the greens, the blues, uh, the whites, the yellows, um, and they are definitely defensive against the color black. Uh, bees have a natural, it's, it's built into their DNA to be defensive against black and mostly because of the predators that have been c coming after them for the m millennia, uh, bears and raccoons um, and, you know, maybe, maybe rats too. But that's why bees kind of typically go after your eyes, your mouth and your ears because these are dark holes. And um, if you're wearing black around a hive, it's not a good idea. Don't ever wear black around a hive. And maybe you've seen some of those TikTok videos of the pretty lady removing bees, wearing all black with, you know, very nice hairdo. Very dangerous, actually. Um, and uh, she looks great, but I don't recommend it. Yeah, stay safe out there, Byron. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about it. And so, yeah, 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 so I'm wearing worry. this black hat, and and it was it was a risk I was willing to take here. It's probably why I got stung <laughs> in the face. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you very much for all the information. Thank you very much. Uh, you can uh, follow uh, Byron at his Instagrams here, uh, and then also check out the LA County Beekeepers Association. Thank you very much, Byron. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for Byron. Me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Wow, I learned so much. That's amazing. And I'm, I want to check out some more books in the library. And I, I remember I used to go to the children's section and check out the children's books because they have some great illustrations in the nonfiction books. So definitely recommend that and all our other resources. So thanks so much for joining us for today's LMA program. Remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org forward slash events. And there's so many programs happening at the library, something for everybody, definitely. Mm -hmm. Also, it's not too late to put in your reading minutes in the summer reading challenge. Um, the Beanstack app, which I have on my phone, I just add those minutes. Um, you collect uh, points for reading and completing fun learning based activities like today's program counts as an activity. And you will then be entered into our grand prize drawing to win a hydro Phonic Arrow Garden, and Steve and I, they're right by Steve's desk because we just got them in. <laughs> and we'll be uh, awarding those at the end of the summer reading program. So go to lapl.org forward slash summer so you can you get all the information. Days. Yeah, two days. So you have time. You can still register, put in your minutes, and you might be a lucky winner. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for something fun that will get you and your family outside and exploring nature, 
What do we have, Steve? Oh, that's the bio blitz right there. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to hold up the summer reading. This was a summer reading. Gorgeous, gorgeous graphics. It's gorgeous, but it's on the Beanstack app too. Mm -hmm. And the bio blitz. Yeah, that I one's iNaturalist, I think, is the app where you can download um, and identify stuff. Like the bumblebee. <laughs> like but the now bumblebee. we know it's probably hard to find those, as Byron just told us. Mm, you have so to go out a little bit. That's really helping LA. Um, you know, if you photograph and share your observations of the wild species of animals, plants, and insects on the app, the iNaturalist app, it's free. Your participation will support our city's effort in protecting the wildlife and their habitats. And you can begin today by going to lapl.org forward slash bio blitz. Steve has it up right there for everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did have cards at the library, but you have like two days to go into the library to pick it up. <laughs> so <laughs> just go to uh, the bio blitz and go on to iNaturalist. Um, did I forget anything else, Steve? No, I think, I think we're good. Yeah, uh, uh, join us uh, for uh, uh, our next LMA program. That's Thursday, uh, the 12th, uh, Jane Russell, 100 year centennial. And you'll have an opportunity to win the free book by author, librarian, uh, Christina Rice. Thanks, Steve. And see yeah. everybody next week. See ya. Thank you.